Welcome in to Outkick the Show. I'm your fearless leader, Clay Travis, and guess what? Hate to brag or draw attention to myself, but your boy is white hot out of the gates in college football gambling. We've won not one, not two, not three, not four, but five consecutive college football games. 2-0 and on college football week zero. 3-0 and on Thursday night last night. I hope that Fade the Picks guy is curled up in the corner shivering over all the money that I have cost his poor, pathetic, broke, loser self. Hashtag respect the picks. Hashtag shoot or shoot. I hope all of you have made a lot of money and have hopped on the Travis train and are driving across the country to pick up all your money. By the way, you can play a free outkick college football pick em, even if you don't gamble. We're giving up away up to $10,000 every week. I tweeted it out. If you are a gambling stone cold assassin, $10,000 a week. All you got to do is go pick all the games right, nail it, go check it out in my Twitter feed. Uh, it's the Outkick College Football Challenge for free completely. Go register, you can make 10 grand a week. Uh, all right, we got a lot to get to. Bunch of different stories that I want to hit. I got a bunch of gambling picks for you going into the weekend. Should have already been betting them, but I'll give them to you all week uh, for the weekend for Saturday, sorry, for tonight, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday, and Monday. I got a little bit for you every single day. All right? 5 and 0, baby. 5 and 0. 5 and 0. All right, let's start what we learned last night. Clemson. Let's start with Clemson. Uh, first of all, I thought Trevor Lawrence, going back and watching a lot of these throws, 13 out of 23, one touchdown, two picks. He didn't look as comfortable as I thought he would, especially against a team that was not actually that good in Georgia Tech. So I thought just okay of a performance from Trevor Lawrence. Not the kind of performance, frankly, that should leave him the Heisman Trophy favorite after week one. Very mediocre. Clemson is going to be favored, according to my buddy Todd Furman, by 17 or more points against everybody they play all season long. And in fact, Texas A&M is one of the toughest teams on their schedule next week in uh, Spartanburg in Clemson. And so, uh, I don't know. Just an okay performance by Clemson. And you know the standard is high for Clemson when they won 52-14 to and we just said, eh, just okay. Uh, Clemson right now, if you listen to my radio show this morning, I'll kick the coverage, I was talking with Joel Klatt in hour three and I think there is a strong argument that right now Clemson this year is to the ACC what USC was to the Pac-12 back during their dynasty years. Just so far head and shoulders above the rest of the conference that it barely even registers in many of these games because they have so much more talent nobody can even step to them or give them much of a challenge. All right. What did we think about Cincinnati and UCLA? This is wild. UCLA was absolutely awful last night. I have said for a long time that it's year two when you can really see whether or not a coach is going to be dominant in his new job. And last year, USC, UCLA played Cincinnati a lot better than they did this year. This was domination. UCLA made two plays all night long. They hit one undercovered man over the middle and he went like 75 yards for a touchdown or whatever it was. And then they hit one deep ball. Otherwise, it was abject failure. Just a total disaster for uh, UCLA. And a big part of UCLA's failure has been the quarterback play's not good. And the offensive play calling appears to lack ingenuity. Their offensive line can't block anybody. Props to Cincinnati. But they should have won this game by three touchdowns. In fact, 
there was a late play call if you were watching UCLA Cincinnati where it appeared UCLA got a scoop and score on the fumble. I think if you just asked me was it a fumble the answer was yes but we didn't have a good video footage of it because they were running into the center of the line of scrimmage but this is just more abject failure for the Pac-12. Here's a stat for you. The Pac-12 is now no longer in my opinion one of the five major football conferences in America. Might have some decent teams. We'll see what happens with Oregon. We'll see what happens with Washington. We'll see what happens with Utah and I'll talk about Utah in a moment. But the Pac-12 in its last five games 0-5 against the American Athletic Conference. The Pac-12 in its last five games against the Mountain West Conference 0-5 against that conference as well. That is not the kind of performance that befits a Power 5 conference. The Pac-12 is a mess right now. UCLA took it on the chin against Cincinnati. Arizona took it on the chin against Hawaii. Neither one of those performances were very good. I'm a big believer in Chip Kelly and what he did at Oregon. But so far he's 3-10 and at UCLA and it doesn't look like the light is close to coming on this year. I had him at 6-6 six and six before the season started. They didn't even look like a 6-6 six and six team last, last night. What about Utah? All right, I went to bed before this one was over. But I told you to take the under. Let me recapitulate the picks. I said take Clemson to cover. I said take Cincinnati, minus two and a half. And I said take the under in this game. Get Kyle Whittingham has now won nine straight games in what is one of the most bitter rivalries in our nation from a college football perspective. Kyle Whittingham went to BYU, turned down the opportunity to be BYU's head coach, and has now beaten his alma mater nine straight times. I want to repeat that. Nine times to go full Ferris Bueller with you. Nine times in a row BYU has lost the Holy War to Utah Utah, I think, is going to win the Pac-12 South. I think they have a good chance to win the Pac-12 overall. We'll wait and see what happens. They have to go on the road against Oregon. But massive win for Utah getting their ninth straight win. Huge for Kyle Whittingham who I believe may well be the most underrated coach in college football. He is now 121-61 and at Utah and he has piloted them into the Big 12 I'm sorry, the Pac-12 and led them to a point where they could actually end up winning the Pac-12 conference this year. That's my analysis on the big three games that went on. Okay? There's also, obviously, Texas A&M. They were playing. I didn't pay a lot of attention to that game. I'll wait to get a review of Texas A&M until I see how they perform against Clemson. Uh, Minnesota got the win. I didn't pay a lot of attention to that one even though it turned into a pretty good game. Uh, that's kind of the breakdown of the opening Thursday night. Again, 5-0 and start. We went 3-0 and last night. You guys know I hate to brag or draw attention to myself, but that is phenomenal. All right? Uh, ACC Network. This is an epic, epic launch fail. If you listen to the radio show, you know that I regularly talk to the guys that I'm on the show with. Danny G, Eddie Garcia, Dub, and Roberto. There are five of us total, if you count me, four guys who work behind the scenes on the radio show. Only one of us, Roberto, actually has the game. Okay? Uh, Eddie Garcia has DirecTV. It's not included in his standard package. Um, Danny G has Spectrum. It's not included in his standard package. We had on my guy Lance Taylor. He has DirecTV. It's not included. Guys, the ACC Network launch has been an unbelievable disaster. There's no other way to convey how bad it has been. Now, they added Dish Network evidently as part of a handshake agreement. But the ACC Network has been such a disaster that they can't even get on in Atlanta. Atlanta, where they have a huge uh, school in Georgia Tech, they can't get Cox and they can't get Comcast to even pick it up. This thing is on a low tier nationwide. It's hard to find. It's going to be a disaster for the first few years, maybe forever because it has a lot more in common with the Pac-12 than it does with the SEC or the Big Ten. The ACC Network launched too late. They tried to go into the cable and satellite market after the cable and satellite market had already imploded. 
cord cutting has blown up. If they had been forward thinking, they would have not tried to do a network like the SEC and the Big Ten. They would have tried to do a digital exclusive only network. It would have been infinitely more, uh, more profitable and it would have been infinitely less expensive and they probably could have gotten a lot of money out of ESPN if they had been able to do it. Instead, they have blown it. They have blown it in the ACC. This thing is not well distributed. It's not going to be well carried. It's going to be a lot like the Pac-12 is my prediction because they aren't getting on standard cable tiers. And some people say, well, what about you know all the streaming services? The challenge with the streaming services is you can sign up a month at a time. So really, if you're obsessed with watching one favorite team, you can sign up for September and cancel it and pay like 10 bucks, right? This is easy to do and you can shut it off right after football season's over. So the ACC network, I think, is in major trouble. And here's what's interesting. Almost no one covers it. There's all these people who work in sports media business and your boy here is the only one who actually tells you the truth. I think the only thing I can figure is there's like a handshake agreement that you're not going to say anything that's actually bad uh, because you want to be able to break news stories and so as a result you don't tell actual truth and so otherwise I don't understand why this is not a major story the fact that the ACC network has been an unmitigated disaster at launch. Clay News Network, Outkick News Network, whatever you want to call it I try to bring you the truth every single day. You might not like it. You might not always agree with me. But I do try to bring you the truth every single day. All right, this story's wild. Last night, I am watching uh, during the, the Cincinnati and UCLA game. And on the bottom ticker of the screen, you know, where they constantly update you on the scores and everything else, used to be a bigger deal before everybody had the internet. I'm watching because I'm like, okay, I want to keep tabs kind of on this uh, Clemson and Georgia Tech game but I don't actually want to be sitting watching you know like feverishly on my phone every play like on a game tracker and I noticed something strange there's some dude that I've never heard of before in my life who evidently used to play in the NFL and it's under the breaking news ticker and ESPN keeps telling me over and over and over again that this guy has announced that he's bisexual And I'm like, how is this breaking news? How is it breaking news that some guy who used to play in the NFL that I have never heard of before is decided to tell everybody that he's bisexual? First of all, it's not breaking news. Presumably, he didn't just decide it today, all right? Secondly, why in the world is that on the ticker as as breaking news? Like, I legitimately don't understand it at all. Let me say, I'm pro-gay marriage. I think you should be able to marry whoever you want. I'm a libertarian. People like to talk about my politics. I am perfectly fine with anything that consenting adults do of a sexual nature that is their choice and again, they're consenting adults. Okay? I just don't care. I don't spend a lot of time sitting around thinking about who is being able to hang out. None of that stuff, right? I don't even think about it. All right? Whatever. Now, I don't understand I don't understand how this is big news. The guy is like the 3,000th or 4,000th best NFL player. And we already had the Michael Sam thing, so we've already had a gay player. How is it big news that a bisexual guy is suddenly announcing to everybody that he's bisexual? I I don't understand it at all. It's, It's nonsensical to me. And how is it big enough breaking news that it's on the damn ticker at the bottom of ESPN. The last time I saw a big news ticker at the bottom on ESPN was that Andrew Luck was retiring. Andrew Luck retiring is a huge news story. A random guy that nobody knows announcing that he's bisexual, it doesn't make any sense at all that it was news, all right? So last night, I go to bed late. I don't spend very much time sleeping in general because I got an early morning radio show. 2.30 in the morning, my son wakes up blood-curdling scream. Your boy goes to comfort him because it's so damn loud and I'm afraid something's going on. 2.30 in the morning, I can't fall back asleep. So I get my phone and I'm like, I need to check and see whether or not I won that bet on Utah against BYU. 
So I grab my phone. I go in figuring the highlights of Utah BYU will probably be right up at the top of ESPN's app which I use a lot and I can see the highlights and see how the game played itself out. Number one story on the app on the day that college football kicks off on the day that the NFL's final 32 teams play their final preseason game the number one story in the world of sports according to ESPN is a guy that I don't know who's the 3,000th or 4,000th best player in the entirety of the NFL that he has announced he is bisexual. This, my friends, is evidence of the woke agenda. Okay? There's nobody out there who thinks this is a legitimately big story. This is an attempt to find a controversial topic and bring it to bear in sports when it doesn't belong at all. I'm perfectly fine with everybody who chooses whatever sexual orientation they want. It doesn't matter to me at all. It doesn't matter to your average NFL fan. This dude is not in the NFL because he's not good enough. So not good enough that none of us have ever even heard of him. His, this is so evident and self-evident to me that his attempt to come out as bisexual is about trying to get attention before he vanishes because he wasn't that good of a football player. And ESPN gave this guy this platform for what reason? I have no idea. It makes absolutely zero sense. It's not news. It's not important. It's not a significant figure. And ESPN shoved this story down our throats. And I gotta say, I think there are probably a lot of parents out there who sat down in front of their television to watch college football opening night and ended up talking with their young kids who can read the ticker about what bisexual means with a six or seven year old. This is ridiculous. It's woke center. You sit down to watch a college football game You expect the ticker to update you on actual breaking news. This ain't it. This ain't it, ESPN. I had an eight-year-old sitting next to me. I could see him reading the ticker. And I'm thinking to myself, oh man, am I going to have to have a talk with him about bisexuality? He doesn't even know what heterosexuality is yet. He doesn't even know what homosexuality is. I've told him that it's fine to love whoever you love. But I haven't gotten into the complicated things. And now I'm going to have to start explaining what bisexuality means? Makes absolutely no sense. Makes absolutely no sense. ESPN blew this. This is not a story. And what's really disappointing to me is the vast majority of American sports fans agree completely with me. But I bet I'm the only person with a substantial audience in America in sports media who will be willing to say how ridiculous this is. Because other people who all agree with me are going to be terrified that the woke media and the woke Twitterati are going to come after them for pointing out how absurd this is. And that's really what ESPN is hoping. They want to go to all the athletes and they want to go to all the coaches and they want to find somebody who will say something other than the typically politically correct answer so they can brand that person as intolerant and so they can get on their soapbox and tell everybody how awful NFL players are, how awful NFL owners are, how awful everybody is because they are going to go around and ask a ton of people about this, just wait. And then they'll justify their story by saying, oh look, this person didn't have the exact prescribed thing they're supposed to say. It's crazy. It's absolutely absurd. Ridiculous. Indefensible. Speaking of indefensible, how about the decision by the media to give DeMarcus Cousins and the NBA a total pass on him getting an arrest warrant out for him for threatening to shoot his baby mama in the head? Can you imagine the reaction? If the NFL had a player on audio who threatened to shoot his baby mama in the head, 
had an arrest warrant out for him and the NFL and the team that employed him did absolutely nothing. The woke media would lose their minds. Roger Goodell needs to be fired. Why isn't he doing anything? Look at the NFL. Look at what's going on here. The NFL doesn't care about women. The NFL doesn't care about disciplining its players. And yet the NBA does it with a super famous dude. The Lakers, so far as I know, haven't done anything. The NBA hasn't done anything. You know why? Because there is a conspiracy afoot. The NFL is considered the conservative bad league. The NBA is considered the woke liberal league. The media gives the NBA a pass. It happened with Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban had way worse sexual harassment stuff going on inside of the Dallas Mavericks franchise than has happened inside of any NBA franchise. Not even remotely close if you read everything that happened with Mark Cuban. Cuban gets a pass. Because he's in the woke NBA and he's not in the conservative NFL. Now this is a lazy miscalculation but guess what? Most people in the media aren't that smart and they adopt easily cliches and easy paths that fulfill their narrative. It is beyond a shadow of a doubt what is going on here. And as a result, your boy remains the most honest and the most truth-telling and the best damn gambler in the entirety of the college football and the NFL and the NBA and sports in general universe. All right, you know what it's time for? It's time for me to make you even richer. Uh, I've got a bunch of gambling picks for you and you guys are going to uh, love these, I believe. Are you ready? 5-0, 5-0, 5-0. All right, we've been 5-0 and so far. Here are some more gambling picks for you. I'm going to run, them, run through them really fast. Uh, Tulsa, Michigan State. I'm on Tulsa. Tulsa tonight against Michigan State. Oklahoma State. I'm on Oklahoma State and I'm on the over in this game between Oklahoma State and Oregon State. Syracuse Liberty. I'm on the over. Uh, Ole Miss Memphis. I'm on the over. South Carolina, North Carolina, I'm on the under. Bama, Duke, line has dropped down to around 32 and a half now. Got up over 35. I like Bama in this game. Northwestern, Stanford, I'm on the under. FAU at Ohio State, I'm on the over here. I think FAU scored some points against them. Toledo, I'm on Toledo against Kentucky. I'm on Mizzou on the road against Wyoming. Georgia, Vandy, I'm on the over in this game. I like Vanderbilt's offensive talent. I think that Georgia will score a lot, but I like... Just By the way, did you see how expensive these tickets are? It's wild. Uh, Auburn. I think Auburn gets it done against Oregon. And I'm on the Houston-Oklahoma over. Those are all the gambling picks. If you like them, dive in and uh, get your wagers in. Again, we have started off 5-0. and The Blood Bank Guarantee. The one that I like the most so far that has not yet happened, I'm telling you, the over in Oklahoma State, Oregon State. Tap the vein. Tap the vein, my friends. Oklahoma State and Oregon State. The over is the blood bank guarantee. Final thoughts. Uh, Jerry Jones has now come out and said he thinks Ezekiel Elliott may miss some games. Pretty wild that uh, Ezekiel Elliott may now miss some games. You can bet at Fox Bet on whether or not this is going to happen. I think that Zeke is not going to be there. Reports are he has to be there by Tuesday. Jerry Jones letting it be known. I think Ezekiel Elliott blew it. He should have been happy to be the second highest paid running back in the entirety of the NFL. This is a bad decision by him. He's already got a five-year contract, essentially. He's only played three years. He's got two years left. I don't like this move by Ezekiel Elliott. I also don't understand why Jerry Jones continues to negotiate in public. I would just stay quiet about this if I were Jerry Jones, but I think now the evidence is all pointing towards Ezekiel Elliott missing a game or more with the Dallas Cowboys. I don't think Jerry Jones can afford to pay him. Not when you got Dak Prescott coming up next year. 
Not when you got Amari Cooper coming up next year. And not when you just gave big money to Jalen Smith. The running back position is overvalued. I'm curious to see how Tony Pollard will do if he starts in week one. I think he will have a lot of success. All right. I love all of you guys. Thanks for hanging out with me. This is Outkick the Show. Be live on Lock It In at 4.30 Eastern, 3.30 Central, 2.30 Mountain, 1.30 Pacific. My name is Clay Travis. DBAP, unless you need to SBAP. Good luck for anybody out there listening right now or watching right now who might be in Florida, in the Sunshine State, in the path of Hurricane Dorian, I think it's called, right? Uh, Hurricane Dorian looks like the real deal. May end up a Category 4. Stay safe. And remember, if you want to potentially win $10,000... Go get your picks in in the Outkick Pick'em Challenge. We could give away as much as $10,000 every single week. Kisses. Love all of you. My name is Clay Travis. This has been Outkick the Show. 5-0, and oh, buddy. Tap the vein. Let's get rich this weekend. I'll see you guys. Bye. Love you. Thank you, Facebook. See y'all.